everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics by Dirk Mateer and Lee Kopic. We're going to be doing chapter 6, problem number 1. The problem begins by stating, a college student enjoys eating pizza. Her willingness to pay for each slice is shown in the following table. Now, I put here the information. What I just labeled this is slice number and willingness to pay. In the original table, it says number of pizza slices and willingness to pay per slice, which I thought was actually, it's a little bit ambiguous, so I just changed the headings here to make the meaning a little bit more clear. In any case, it's important to understand what we mean when we say willingness to pay. So the willingness to pay for an item is just the maximum amount that a consumer is willing, able, and ready to pay for an item. That might not be the same as the actual market price, as we'll see in a minute, but it's really the answer to that hypothetical question, okay, there's a slice of pizza placed in front of you, what is the maximum amount you are willing to give me in order to get that slice of pizza? Okay. So here we can think of this as this particular student would be willing to pay a maximum of $6 to get that first slice of pizza. She's willing to buy a second slice of pizza but not for as high of a price. She said, yeah, I'll take a second one, but I'm only gonna pay you $5 for that second one, and $4 for the third one, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this isn't entirely surprising because as we get more and more slices of pizza, we're kind of getting full, right? And as we're getting full, we're not gonna be willing to pay as much for things that make us even more full, right? So this is a pretty typ typ sorry, typical pattern that we see both within an individual and also to some degree across markets. And it actually explains why there's another way of showing that demand curves slope downwards. But anyway, back to the problem. So it's part A, if pizza slices cost $3 each, how many slices will she buy? So that's pretty easy. We could say if our market price is $3, this person would go through and say, well, I was going to give you or willing to give you $6 for the first one. You're only charging me three. That's cool. I'll buy it. I was willing to pay you $5 for the second one. You're again only charging me three. So yeah, that sounds good. And so on and so forth. Technically speaking, she's kind of indifferent as to whether or not to pick up this fourth slice of pizza because she's being charged exactly her maximum that she'd be willing to pay. But she'd say, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. You're charging me the absolute maximum I would pay for this item, but I guess I'll still buy it. So what we would see in this situation is that the quantity of pizza slices that this student consumes would be four, right? Because if you're trying to charge someone $3 for something that they're only willing to pay two for, obviously they're not going to choose to buy that unit of the good. So the second part of the question says, how much consumer surplus will she enjoy? So consumer surplus, either for an individual or for a whole market of individuals, is just the total benefits or the total amount of value that consumers get from consuming above and beyond the price that they pay for the item. So mathematically, we can think about consumer surplus as the difference between the maximum that somebody would have paid for a good and how much they actually pay for it. And you can think about why that makes sense, that I get some sort of intangible value if I can say, well, I would have paid you $6 for that slice of pizza and you only charged me $3. But now I can pay you $3 for something that's worth $6 to me. I got $3 of value out of that transaction. And I get value out of a transaction every time there's a spread between my valuation of the item and what I'm actually paying for it. So we can find the consumer surplus by simply adding up the amount of surplus that this student gets on each unit of consumption. So we'd say here, because she's consuming four slices of pizza, we could figure out her consumer surplus on the first slice, the second slice, the third slice, and the fourth slice, and then add those up to get her total consumer surplus. So we could do that. We could say consumer surplus, which is usually notated by CS. 
We can think about this first slice of pizza. So her willingness to pay or her valuation of the slice of pizza was $6. She only paid $3. So she's going to get consumer surplus in the amount of the difference between those two things. And then for the second unit, same procedure. She was willing to pay $5, but she again only had to pay $3. So she gets $2 worth of you know, intangible value from that transaction involving the second slice of pizza. She gets, because you know, she's still consuming, she gets the spread between her willingness to pay $4 and the market price of $3. On that third slice of pizza, and this fourth one is pretty interesting because we can literally do the same thing. But what we notice is that there is no spread between the consumer's valuation of the item and the actual price. That she valued that fourth slice of pizza at $3 and was charged $3. So she's not actually getting any positive surplus from that. And we can see that we've just added zero into her total consumer surplus. And if we were to simplify this, this is just going to be 3 plus 2 plus 1 plus 0, which is, of course, $6. And it's helpful to put a unit of dollars on consumer surplus because that's how consumer surplus is, in fact, measured. Part B of the question says, if the price of slices falls to $2, how much consumer surplus will she enjoy? So again, we can repeat this same procedure. We can start very simply by just writing down that the equilibrium price of pizza slices is now $2. In order to start this consumer surplus calculation, we do need to understand how many slices of pizza this student is actually going to be consuming. Because by definition, one can't be getting consumer surplus on units that they don't actually purchase. So we need to figure out where to stop this calculation which means we need to know the quantity. So we can look here, and we can say, well, if the price of pizza slices is $2, she's willing to buy the first one, because she's like, oh, I would have paid $6. This is awesome. The same for the second one, third one, fourth one. And now, she's not being charged her full valuation until we get to the fifth slice of pizza. So when the price drops to $2, this individual now wants to consume five slices of pizza. And we've just shown in a very simple way why demand curves slope downwards, right? So we can say now, at a price of $2, our quantity is five. So we want to go through and calculate our consumer surplus on each of the first five units of consumption now. So we'll notice that two things have changed in this calculation. One, we're adding up consumer surplus over more units, but two, we're getting a bigger spread between willingness to pay and price on each of those units. So check this out. Now, our consumer surplus, even though our willingness to pay hasn't changed, our consumer surplus on the first unit is now the willingness to pay of $6 minus the market price of $2. So we're getting a bigger spread because the price went down. And we could keep doing this, the consumer surplus on the second unit is the willingness to pay of $5 minus the price of $2. The consumer surplus from the third unit is the willingness to pay of $4 minus the price of $2. The consumer surplus from the fourth unit is a willingness to pay of $3 minus the market price of $2. And the consumer surplus on the last unit is again zero because she's being charged her entire willingness to pay of $2. So we can see now, of course, that this is equal to 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 plus 0, which is just $10. And this illustrates the fact that, in general, consumer surplus increases when prices decrease. And that happens for two reasons, and we already alluded to one of them. It happens because consumers get additional surplus or a larger level of surplus 
on units that they were already consuming at the higher price. You know, we can compare here. 6 minus 2 is bigger than 6 minus 3. 5 minus 2 is bigger than 5 minus 3. And so on and so forth. But they're also getting additional consumer surplus because we're adding up surplus over a larger quantity. So you can think about those two levers driving this observation that prices and consumer surplus actually move in opposite directions. One point of clarification that's likely helpful for some of you is when to think about consumer surplus in sort of a discrete sense like we just did here and when to calculate consumer surplus by just looking at a smooth demand curve and then looking at the area that we defined as consumer surplus, which oftentimes look, look, looks like this triangle here, where we have our rules that consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve, above the price to the consumer, and to the left of the quantity that the consumer is actually consuming. And we have those rules, and we say, well, when do we do this versus when do we do this? And I point this out because I've actually given questions like this on exams and then I've had some overzealous students, you know, well-meaning but overzealous, they actually tried to figure out based on this, you know, essentially demand schedule or willingness to pay schedule, what the demand curve would look like. Plot these points, make a smooth demand curve, take the area of the triangle, and so on and so forth. And you get a number that's a little bit different than what we have here. So when you think about this, it's pretty easy to determine which way you should go. That if you're given discrete information in either a demand schedule or a table with willingness to pay, etc., just do this. Because what we're assuming is that we're only consuming discrete units of this product, right? Whereas when we're looking at a, a smooth demand curve, what we're actually doing is we're assuming that we can, con that we can consume you know, any fractional unit, that we're dealing with a continuous function here, and that our willingness to pay is just, you know, infinitesimally decreasing a little bit for an increasingly, you know, a small increase in quantity demanded and so on and so forth. So here, if you're given a demand curve, do the consumer surplus this way, but if you're just given this table, do the consumer surplus like this.